Since this is a very disturbing story, but it happened. Scientists working for the U.S. government secretly gave people sexually transmitted diseases. 83 people died during those experiments. What the United States government did was shameful. What happens when the people sworn to protect you become the ones you need protection from? In this episode, we dive into the nightmarish experiments conducted by the U.S. government on its own citizens. From twisted mind control trials to inhumane chemical tests, prepare to uncover the horrifying reality of what the U.S. government has done to its people in the name of science. Experiment 15, the Tuskegee study, killed people through syphilis. The Tuskegee experiment, also known as the Tuskegee syphilis study, began in 1932 when there was no known cure for syphilis, a highly contagious disease. The United States Public Health Service, PHS, working with Tuskegee University, then the Tuskegee Institute, a historically black college in Alabama, started this study. They promised free medical care to 600 African-American men from Macon County, Alabama, luring them into a project aimed at studying the full course of the disease. Most of these men were sharecroppers and had never seen a doctor before. Sadly, participants were not told the true purpose of the study. Instead, doctors from the PHS who were running the study informed the men 399 of whom had latent syphilis and a control group of 201 who were free of the disease, that they were being treated for bad blood. This term was commonly used in the area at the time to describe various illnesses. By 1943, after 15 years of the study, penicillin was widely used to treat syphilis. However, the men in the Tuskegee study were not given this treatment. Instead, health workers monitored them and provided placebos like aspirin and mineral supplements. Many men suffered, dying, going blind, or becoming insane because their syphilis was left untreated. In the mid-1960s, Peter Buxton, a PHS investigator in San Francisco, discovered the study and raised ethical concerns with his superiors. The PHS officials formed a committee to review the study, but shockingly decided to continue it. They wanted to follow the participants until they all died, perform autopsies, and analyze the data. In 1972, the Associated Press published a story about the study causing a national outcry. By then, over 120 people had already died from syphilis, while 100 others had succumbed to various related illnesses. Tragically, at least 40 spouses were also found to have the disease, and 19 children were born with it, inheriting the illness from their mothers. The Assistant Secretary for Health and Scientific Affairs then set up an ad hoc advisory panel to review the study. The panel found it to be ethically unjustified. In October 1972, the panel recommended ending the study. A month later, the Assistant Secretary announced its termination. On May 16, 1997, President Bill Clinton stood before the nation and issued a heartfelt presidential apology for the infamous study. With a solemn expression, he acknowledged the deep wrongs that had been done and announced a meaningful step towards healing. Clinton revealed plans to establish the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University, aiming to ensure such injustices would never happen again. The last person involved in the study lived until 2004, marking the end of a painful chapter in history. Experiment 14, the Willowbrook Hepatitis Study gave kids hepatitis. The Willowbrook State School, built by New York State in 1947, was meant to house children and young adults with intellectual disabilities. It was designed for 4,000 residents, but often housed over 6,000, peaking at 6,200 in 1969. The conditions were horrific, with rampant disease, neglect, and abuse. In 1955, Dr. Saul Krugman, an epidemiology professor was brought in to control infectious diseases that spread rapidly through the institution. However, instead of preventing the spread, Krugman encouraged it to test his theories on hepatitis treatments. This led to the infamous Willowbrook Hepatitis Study. One heart-wrenching story involves 10-year-old Nina Galen, whose mother, Diana McCourt, was seeking care for her severely autistic daughter. Dr. Krugman offered McCourt a spot in the newer, cleaner research wards with more staff, if Nina joined the experiments. Feeling coerced, McCord agreed, believing her daughter might receive an antidote to hepatitis. 
When McCourt questioned why the studies couldn't be done on animals, she was told it was too expensive. Nina became one of more than 50 children, ages five to 10, being used by Dr. Krugman and his team. In a controversial part of the study, Dr. Krugman and his team gave healthy children hepatitis by mixing the virus into chocolate milk. They observed how much virus was needed to make the children sick, then let them recover, only to expose them to the virus again. The goal was to see if recovery from hepatitis once would protect them from future infections. Dr. Krugman's work significantly advanced the development of a hepatitis vaccine. However, it raises an important ethical question. Was it truly necessary or right to risk the health of these children for the benefit of many? Experiment 13, Project MKUltra, LSD Mind Control. On April 10, 1953, Alan Dulles, the new director of the CIA, spoke to Princeton alumni as the Korean War neared its end. Earlier that week, the New York Times had revealed that American POWs from Korea might have been brainwashed by communists, with some even refusing to return to the US. Reportedly, some of these POWs were so deeply influenced that they didn't want to return to the United States at all. Dulles condemned these Soviet brainwashing techniques as effective but morally wrong, arguing they went against American and human values. Despite this, just three days later, he approved MKUltra, a secret CIA program for using biological and chemical materials covertly. MKUltra's mind control experiments used methods like electroshock therapy, hypnosis, and various drugs including LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide. Subjects ranged from volunteers to those unaware of their involvement. The program targeted vulnerable groups, including prisoners, who were often coerced into participating for benefits like reduced sentences. Whitey Bulger, a former crime boss, described horrific experiences with LSD during MK Ultra tests, including severe paranoia and hallucinations. The CIA's interest in LSD shifted from defensive to offensive uses, aiming to control individuals regardless of their consent. On November 18, 1953, 10 scientists in Maryland decided that an unwitting experiment would best reveal the drug's value. The CIA's early LSD experiments were shockingly unethical, often involving non-consenting individuals, including some CIA employees. By 1963, these experiments had become more complex but ended abruptly after John Vance of the CIA Inspector General's staff discovered the secret dosing and initiated hearings. The hearings revealed some unsettling facts, especially about the 1953 death of Dr. Frank Olson, an army scientist. Dr. Olson died after he jumped out of a hotel window, just days after he unknowingly drank a beverage laced with LSD. Despite efforts to continue, the inspector general insisted on halting the unethical research. In 1977, Senator Edward Kennedy led hearings to investigate MKUltra, questioning former CIA employees about the program. However, in 1973, the MKUltra director had ordered the destruction of all related files, effectively erasing records of one of the U.S.'s most illegal operations. Experiment 12, Project 4.1 exposed people to fallout. From 1947 until the Marshall Islands gained independence in 1986, the United States was responsible for overseeing the islands and promised to protect their well-being. However, during this time, American scientists were involved in a troubling project known as Project 4.1. This project secretly studied the effects of radiation on the Marshallese people without their consent. On March 1, 1954 at Bikini Atoll, the U.S. detonated its most powerful weapon ever, a thermonuclear bomb named Castle Bravo. This bomb was equivalent to 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. Despite the massive explosions, the U.S. military did not immediately evacuate nearby islands, leaving many Marshallese people in danger. Even though there were over 17,000 U.S. personnel in the area, hundreds of Marshallese on other affected islands were never evacuated. Rongelop Atoll was hit hardest. After the Castle Bravo explosion, the residents experienced severe radiation sickness. The U.S. government's slow response to evacuate islanders and failure to protect hundreds more from radiation was horrendous. Instead of addressing the immediate needs of the affected people, the U.S. focused its efforts on studying the fallout. In the 1970s, 
U.S. scientists told Bikini residents it was safe to return to their atoll, but the food and water there were still dangerously radioactive. The U.S. downplayed these risks until, in 1978, radiation levels in Bikini exceeded U.S. safety standards. Many residents suffered from radiation sickness, cancers, birth defects, and other serious health issues. The diplomat reported that babies born during this time looked like piles of grapes or jellyfish, with beating hearts but no bones. Despite this, the U.S. government continued to minimize the impact of Project 4.1. The long-term effects included chronic illnesses and genetic damage passed to future generations. Today, cancer remains a major cause of death in the Marshall Islands. Experiment 11, Operation Big Buzz, Mosquito Biological Warfare. One of the lesser known U.S. military experiments was called Operation Big Buzz, conducted in 1955. This secret test held in Savannah, Georgia, and later in Avon Park, Florida in 1956, aimed to explore a new method of biological warfare. In these tests, the military dropped over 300 giant mosquitoes from airplanes and scattered them on the ground. The goal was to see if these mosquitoes, specifically yellow fever mosquitoes, known as Aedes aegypti, could be used to spread diseases. Another aim was to determine if the mosquitoes could survive the drop and find hosts to bite. To carry out this experiment, one million female mosquitoes were bred. Out of these, 330,000 uninfected mosquitoes were dispersed from planes and via special bombs released on the ground. The rest were infected to test if they could carry yellow fever and how they could be stored and used in weapons. The mosquitoes were found to travel up to 2,000 feet from where they were released. Once in populated areas, the mosquitoes began biting humans and guinea pigs. Within a day, many had entered homes and bitten residents, showing they could spread easily. The public was kept in the dark about this, leading to fears and ethical concerns about consent and potential health risks. Experiment 10, Holmesburg Prison Experiment, corroded prisoners' skin. From the 1950s to the 1970s, the American medical field failed to uphold the principles of the Hippocratic Oath and the Nuremberg Code, betraying the trust and safety of countless individuals. During these decades, Dr. Albert Kligman conducted experiments on inmates at Philadelphia's Holmesburg Prison, paying them meager sums for participating in a variety of medical tests from facial creams and skin moisturizers to perfumes, detergents, and anti-rash treatments. The experiments extended to far more dangerous substances, including radioactive materials, dioxin, and chemical warfare agents. The prisoners, often lacking education and in dire need of money, were in a highly vulnerable position. In such an environment, exploitation was almost inevitable. Alan M. Hornblum, a dedicated researcher and author of seven books, uncovered this troubling history. His 1998 book, Acres of Skin, sheds light on the abuse and greed that fueled these experiments. Dr. Kligman used the phrase acres of skin to refer to the inmates available for his experiments, exploiting them for nearly 25 years. Hornblum's detailed interviews with former prisoners revealed severe health issues such as skin conditions and cancers, highlighting the moral failures and financial motivations behind these experiments. Experiment 9, Operation Sea Spray, released bioweapon in San Francisco. Starting on September 26, 1950, and continuing for six days, the U.S. Navy carried out a secretive experiment known as Operation Sea Spray. They released two types of bacteria from a ship just off the coast of San Francisco. The goal was to see how a major city like San Francisco would respond to a biological attack by terrorists. Over the next few days, military personnel collected samples from 43 different locations to track how the bacteria spread. They found that it quickly spread not only throughout the city, but also into the surrounding suburbs. During this test, residents in these areas would have inhaled millions of tiny bacterial spores. The experiment showed that cities like San Francisco, with similar size and layout, could be vulnerable to biological warfare. At that time, the U.S. military believed that Seracia bacteria were harmless to humans. This bacteria was mostly known for causing red spots on contaminated food and wasn't linked to many diseases. On October 11, 1950, 11 residents were admitted to Stanford Hospital with severe urinary tract infections. Although 10 of them recovered, Edward J. Nevin, 
who had recently undergone prostate surgery, tragically died three weeks later from a heart valve infection. There was also a rise in pneumonia cases in San Francisco following the release of Seracia marcescens. It appears that the Army did not inform health authorities before spreading the bacteria across the region. Experiment 8, Vanderbilt Radiation Experiments, gave radiation to pregnant women. In the early 1940s, scientists working on the Manhattan Project encountered numerous challenges while handling newly discovered elements whose health effects were still unknown. Back then, scientists had minimal understanding of how plutonium and uranium affected the human body, even as they used these elements to build atomic bombs. Researchers at various laboratories raced against time to figure out the dangers faced by Manhattan Project workers and how to protect them. They collected data from instruments, blood and urine samples, and physical exams. Radiation experiments were also conducted on animals in labs in Chicago, Berkeley, and Rochester. Despite these efforts, medical experts concluded that the data was insufficient to establish safety guidelines for workers. By 1944, Stafford Warren, the head of the Manhattan Project's medical team, decided that controlled human experiments were necessary. This led to the injection of radioactive elements into civilian patients, including pregnant women. Among those injected, 18 were given plutonium, 6 uranium, 5 polonium, and at least 1 americium. Disturbingly, in 1969, the American Journal of Epidemiology published a study that revealed that three children born to these women likely died because of radiation exposure. An 11-year-old girl died of a tumor, an 11-year-old boy died of cancer, and a 5-year-old boy died of lymphatic leukemia. These revelations came alongside other disclosures by the Department of Energy, DOE, about previously secret nuclear explosions and tests on human subjects conducted since World War II. The DOE, represented by spokeswoman Marianne Freeman, is seeking information on the Vanderbilt experiments and other radiation tests conducted on civilians during the Cold War. In another shocking disclosure, the DOE revealed that researchers gave radioactive pills to 751 pregnant women seeking free care at a prenatal clinic run by Vanderbilt University, Tennessee. These pills exposed the women and their fetuses to radiation levels 30 times higher than normal, equivalent to an X-ray. Surprisingly, these women were not informed about the potential effects of radiation, or even if they knew they were being given radioactive pills. Experiment 7. The Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital Study Injected Elderly with Cancer In the summer of 1963, Chester M. Southam, a prominent doctor at the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research and other prestigious institutions, conducted a controversial experiment. Along with Deo Gracias B. Custodio, an unlicensed medical resident from the Philippines at the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital, JCDH in Brooklyn, New York, Southam aimed to determine if the immune deficiency in cancer patients was due to their cancer or their weakened condition. They injected live cultured cancer cells into 22 frail elderly patients who did not have cancer, believing these cells would be rejected without harm. However, the patients were not informed about the nature of the injections, resulting in severe distress, worsening health, and some deaths. The experiment sparked public outrage with critics comparing it to Nazi medical practices, while some defended Southam's intentions and scientific contributions. William A. Hyman, a director at JCDH, brought the issue to the Brooklyn Supreme Court, accusing the hospital of using patients as guinea pigs without consent. The Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center later revealed that the research showed cancer patients might lack an immune mechanism found in others, providing valuable information. Despite initial claims of patient consent, it was revealed that patients were unaware they were injected with cancer cells. The experiment continued, but only with written consent from patients, highlighting serious ethical breaches. Experiment 6, Fernald Radioactive Oatmeal Study, gave children radioactive oatmeal. The Fernald State School, originally known as the Massachusetts School for the Feeble-Minded, housed not only mentally disabled children, but also those abandoned by their parents. Life at the school was harsh and often cruel. The boys were denied food, forced into hard labor, and subjected to abuse. But the story gets even darker. Between the late 1940s and early 1950s, Robert Harris, a nutrition professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, 
conducted three experiments involving 74 boys from Fernal, aged 10 to 17. Back then, scientists were eager to explore human health, and with the breakfast cereal industry booming, there was a lot of money at stake. Brands like Quaker needed scientific backing to outshine their competitors. Quaker had been in fierce competition with Cream of Wheat, a farina-based cereal since the early 1900s. Both companies also had to face the growing popularity of sugary dry cereals, promoted heavily through advertising. In these experiments, the Fernal Boys ate oats coated with radioactive iron tracers, drank milk with radioactive calcium tracers, and received injections of radioactive calcium. The radioactive atoms helped scientists measure how the body absorbed these nutrients. The results were promising for Quaker. Oatmeal didn't inhibit the absorption of iron and calcium any more than Farina did. The third experiment showed that calcium in the bloodstream went directly to the bones, which was crucial for later studies on osteoporosis. The boys remained unaware of the true nature of their contaminated cereal for 40 years. The truth emerged in 1993 when Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary declassified documents from the Atomic Energy Commission. This revelation was partly due to Eileen Wellsom's investigative reporting on other U.S. government radiation experiments and growing concerns about the nuclear weapons industry. A report in the Boston Globe followed, encouraging victims to speak out. One of these boys, Fred Boyce, had been abandoned by his family and eagerly joined the science club at Fernal, hoping the scientists would notice the mistreatment and put an end to it. We didn't know anything at the time, Boyce recalled about the experiments. We just thought we were special. Discovering the truth about the club felt like a profound betrayal. When the case finally reached the courtroom, 30 former students from Fernald filed a lawsuit against both MIT and Quaker Oats. By 1995, the situation had gained so much attention that President Clinton personally apologized to the Fernald students. The apology was because the Atomic Energy Commission had indirectly funded the study through a contract with MIT's Radioactivity Center. A few years later, in January 1998, a settlement of $1.85 million was agreed upon. Experiment 5, the Monster Study, gave orphan children speech impediments. The Monster Study was a chilling experiment on stuttering conducted in 1939 in Davenport, Iowa. Wendell Johnson, a well-known speech pathologist, and his graduate student, Mary Tudor, led the study at the University of Iowa. They selected 22 children from a veteran's orphanage for their research. The children were unaware of the true purpose of the experiment, believing they were receiving speech therapy. Tudor aimed to induce stuttering in children who spoke normally and see if telling stutterers their speech was fine would make a difference. Among the 22 children, 10 had been labeled as stutterers by their teachers and caregivers before the study began. Tudor, along with five other graduate students acting as judges, listened to each child's speech and rated them from one to five, confirming the school's assessments. The children labeled as stutterers went through intense speech therapy, facing harsh criticism of their speech, while the normal speakers received regular speech therapy. The study lasted several months, during which the stutterer group endured emotional stress and criticism aimed at making them stutter. Many kids started having trouble speaking and dealing with their feelings and these problems stuck with them as they grew up. The experiment blatantly ignored ethical standards like do no harm and informed consent, leading to heavy criticism for deceiving and emotionally manipulating vulnerable children. Though the study happened long before formal research oversight existed, it sparked outrage, especially within the scientific community. It serves as a haunting reminder of the ethical issues that can arise in the quest for scientific knowledge. While the study added to our understanding of speech development, it did so at the cost of the children's emotional well-being. It highlights the essential need for strict adherence to ethical principles in research and constant vigilance to ensure that scientific investigations respect the dignity and rights of participants. Experiment 4, the Guatemalan Syphilis Experiment, gave Guatemalan syphilis. At the beginning of World War II, U.S. medical researchers faced a challenging task finding a way to prevent soldiers from contracting sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, when they interacted with prostitutes. By the early 1940s, scientists made a breakthrough discovery. Penicillin could clear up symptoms of syphilis in just a few days. 
This finding led the U.S. military to use penicillin as a treatment after potential STD exposure. However, it was still unknown whether penicillin could prevent future infections or be effective against other STDs. Additionally, penicillin was in short supply, and researchers wanted to explore other options, such as Orvis Maparsin, a substance that could be used as a foaming wash after exposure. This led to the creation of the Guatemala study, also known as the Guatemala Syphilis Experiment, which took place from 1946 to 1948. Researchers conducted experiments to test various ways of preventing gonorrhea, syphilis, and chancroid. One of the most controversial methods involved normal exposure, where sex workers infected with syphilis were used to transmit the disease to unsuspecting Guatemalan prisoners. Much of the research was done at a 300-bed hospital in Guatemala City, specifically built for the study. The city was chosen because it had many prisoners and other potential subjects. Sadly, many participants suffered from untreated diseases and serious health problems, and some even died as a result of the experiments. Experiment 3, the Stateville Penitentiary Malaria Study, gave inmates malaria. During World War II, malaria research was conducted in U.S. prisons, with a notable example being Stateville Penitentiary in Illinois. Here, researchers deliberately infected prisoners with malaria to test new anti-malaria drugs. The prison setting was ideal for controlled experiments because it allowed researchers to keep many variables constant. The experiments used the prison's unique environment to their advantage. All participants were white men of similar age and health, reflecting the typical demographic of Stateville's population. The strict environment of a maximum security prison also meant the behavior of the prisoners was more uniform. The researchers could track nearly every participant closely because all of them had long-term sentences, parole re-evaluation offers and financial incentives, ranging from $25 to $100, made it easy to find volunteers willing to take part in these trials. Prisoners in these studies endured severe malaria symptoms, including high fevers, chills, and significant illness. Some experienced long-term health issues due to the intense nature of the experiments. Although the Stateville research led to several publications, it had little lasting impact on malaria treatment. The primary legacy of these experiments is the ethical debate they sparked about using prisoners for medical research, echoing the moral issues raised by Nazi Germany's human experiments. Experiment 2, Operation White Coat, tested biological agents on unknowing volunteers. Operation White Coat kicked off in 1954, during the early years of the Cold War. The big worry at the time was that Russia might be ahead in developing biological weapons. The U.S. was struggling to keep up and was testing on rats and monkeys. But animal reactions didn't always match those of humans, so the U.S. Army turned to the Seventh-day Adventist Church for help. The church's members, known for their strict health practices, including no smoking or drinking, and a strong belief in the commandment, you must not kill, were conscientious objectors who chose not to fight in wars. They volunteered to be part of experiments instead. Richard Stenbachen dedicated nearly 24 years of his life as an army chaplain before taking on the role of director for the church's chaplain ministries across the globe. He explains that the church gave its blessing to the plan because it was a win-win situation. It allowed members to honor their Sabbath on Saturdays while also benefiting the church's broader mission. A key part of the white coat experiments was a massive 40-foot high steel sphere known as the eight ball. Here's how it worked. Scientists would fill the eight ball with dangerous viruses or bacteria in the form of an aerosol. Volunteers wearing gas masks would then breathe in the contaminated air through connections to the eight ball. What happened to them afterward is still unclear. Operation White Coat came to an end in 1973 when the U.S. draft was discontinued, meaning there were no more conscientious objectors to conscript. Experiment 1, the San Antonio Contraceptive Study, gave women fake birth control. Just when you think you've heard it all about unethical medical experiments, history has a new shocker for you. Back in the early 1970s, a birth control clinic in San Antonio ran a disturbing study on poor Mexican-American women. The research led by Dr. Goldzier involved nearly 400 women who came to the clinic looking for birth control. Most of these women were low income and had never used birth control pills before. The study aimed to see if minor side effects from different birth control pills 
were truly due to the synthetic hormones in the pills. In this experiment, the women were randomly given either one of four types of birth control pills or a placebo, a dummy pill, for six months. They were never told that they might receive a placebo or that they were part of a research study. As a result, many women reported side effects like headaches, anxiety, depression, and weight gain. But here's the shocking part. Out of the 76 women who received the placebo, at least 10 ended up pregnant, while only one woman in the other groups got pregnant. The results were shared at a major fertility conference, causing an outcry due to the deceitful treatment of these vulnerable women. The study was later highlighted in the 1973 Senate hearings on human experimentation, which eventually led to the formation of the National Commission in 1974. Henry Beecher used the Gold Zier study to demonstrate the urgent need for better ethical standards in research, emphasizing that there's still much work to be done. Senator Mondale condemned the study, comparing it to the notorious Tuskegee experiments as utterly outrageous, immoral, and an affront to human dignity. It makes you wonder why this study isn't as infamous as other cases like Tuskegee or Willowbrook. Which of these cases do you consider most unethical? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.